In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The sermon this morning is based on the reading from the Gospel. During the Sundays after Epiphany, our focus, our readings, are directed toward the earthly ministry of the Christ, of Jesus. In these readings, we see the beginnings of things that end up being or are from the very beginning the basic parts of the ministry of the Christ. The issue with Epiphany, or the trouble with Epiphany, is Epiphany is sometimes short, sometimes long. Always starts with the baptism of our Lord, always ends with transfiguration, but could be one week or could be eight weeks in between. So there are times when we only have the one reading and we don't hear all of those readings. Or maybe we forget them. Or as the, is the case this year, this is a great thing. It goes so long, I think it goes the full eight weeks. We'll get all of these readings, all of these parts, all of this beginning of the earthly ministry of the Christ. So how does it go? Well, as I said, it begins with the baptism of our Lord. Baptism of our Lord is all about the Christ who takes the place of sinners. He takes our place in holy baptism. He is no sinner, requires no baptism, but stands there as sinner. And this is all set up. This is all prophetic for what he would do down the road when he takes the place of sinners on the cross itself. Receives the punishment that is due to sinners so that we can receive the forgiveness of our sins. After that, you have uh, one of the principal miracles, the first miracles. It is the turning of water into wine at Cana of Galilee. So the miraculous uh, ability of Jesus is able to do things which we cannot do. In last week's reading, we see Jesus doing healings in Capernaum. He starts out with Peter's mother-in-law, who was sick. He goes to her. They appeal uh, for, uh, to him on her behalf. He goes and heals her. And once that news gets out, everybody in town, every sick person, every demonized person, they all show up. They all want to see the Christ. The doctor's in. Good. He does it. He heals. Drives him away. All day. All night. In last week's reading, you also have preaching. The preaching of Jesus. We have the occasion where Jesus goes back to his home synagogue in Nazareth and preaches this sermon. It's interesting because he shows up for church on that day. He receives the scroll, as it has already been turned to that portion of the prophet Isaiah selected for that day. And rather than reading the reading given to him, he adjusts the reading and he finds just the right place where the Messiah is predicted, preaching and teaching coming from his mouth is explained. And he tells them, in your hearing, in my speech, in my reading, these very words about the Messiah are being fulfilled. At first, there's a positive response. There's a good response. Oh, hey, there's Jesus. You remember when he was a kid? Such a great guy. But by the end of the sermon, they completely turned on him. By the end of the sermon, they are quite angry with him and his preaching and his judgment. They drive him out of the synagogue to the brow of the hill on which the city is built, if you recall. And when they go, they're not going up there to say, hey, Jesus, look at the sights. Isn't it pretty? They're there to throw him down that cliff and to injure him severely, if not, to kill him. He passes through and he goes on. Well, all of these things are important parts, essential parts of the ministry of Christ. And today we have one more added, one more piece of that grand puzzle, and it is the inclusion now, the calling of the disciples. This calling of the disciples, by the way, is not Jesus looking for help with the ministry. You know, I'd be more, so much more efficient as a Messiah if I had helpers to come along with me to carry bags and carry money and do this and that. I mean, don't get me wrong, they do help, and they do some preaching, so on and so forth. But the main purpose, the true reason for the calling of the disciples is to be, from the very beginning of the ministry, the eyewitness 
to what the Christ is doing. The main reason for the calling of these disciples is to be the ones who will hear, who will see, and in the end will write and will preach about who Jesus Christ is and what he has done. Not just say during his time among us and during that time of that earthly ministry, but especially after his death, after his resurrection, and after his ascension. You see, this is the setup, this is the pattern for the ministry that will unfold after the Christ ascends. That the apostles will be sent out with the word of God. The apostles will be sent out with the preaching of the gospel, with the administration of the sacraments. To bring people to faith in Christ. To call people to repentance and to call people to trust in Christ as their Savior. This is their goal, this is their purpose, and this is their responsibility as apostles. Now in the reading, Luke kind of eases us into this passage when he says, On one occasion, Jesus is down by the lakeside. This is immediately after the healings in Capernaum. And so he's got this crowd that is still following him, still pursuing him, wanting to hear his teaching, wanting to hear the words that come from his mouth. And you have the situation where Jesus is basically backed up against the lake and has all these people pressing against him in front of him. His desire is to preach. So what's the best way? Well, he observes that there are these two boats that are over to the side. The fishermen were out uh, in the night. The fishermen were working. They're sitting there. They're cleaning their nets. They're mending their nets. But they're done with their work. And so he appeals to Peter. Hey, you don't look too busy. Mind if I borrow one of your boats? Even better, why don't you get out of that boat and do a little paddling for me? Get me out a little bit off the shore. I'll speak to the people. And after I'm done, we'll talk. And that's what happens. They go out. Jesus preaches this sermon. But the contents of the sermon are in no way recorded for us. I mean, I always think I want to have as many of Jesus' sermons as possible to find out if I'm doing this right or wrong, right? Or wrong. But it's not mentioned at all. And the reason there is it's not the point. The point in this case is not so much the preaching of Jesus, which we know more or less is about the coming of the kingdom of God in Christ, that he is the Messiah, those kinds of things. We know that. But the point here is going to be Peter himself and what Jesus is sending Peter to become. And so he says to Peter, now that I'm done with the preaching, let's take this boat out a little bit into the deeper water. <laughs> and then why don't you throw your nets over for a catch? Now here's the thing. Jesus is a rabbi. Okay, that's good. He teaches the word of God. Uh, Jesus, by training, we believe he's a, a carpenter, right? This is Joseph's trade. We think that Jesus would have learned this as well. So there's no indication here in Jesus' background, in his history, in his experience, that he would be what? Expert fisherman. And so Peter, you know, reminds him of this. Oh, hey, uh, Master. Not to push back too much, but we who are fishermen, who actually know how to do this, we've been out all night. We've been out fishing, we've been out doing our thing, and we found no fish. We dropped the nets, we went to all the right spots, we did our best to figure this out because, hey, you're a fisherman, we do this for a living, this is a natural business. But because you make the request, we'll do it. In other words, Peter is not expecting to catch anything at all. He does not think that Jesus is super fisherman. He doesn't think that Jesus knows where all the fish is and that one looks pure that tells you. He just saying, fine, you're the master, out of respect, let's go, we'll do it. And then he drops the net. Immediately, without delay, that net is filled. That net is filled to such a degree that when he tries to pull it in, the net itself, itself starts to break, starts to fall apart. 
Peter calls to his friends, the people he works with on the shore. Hey, you guys, get out of here quick. We've got all these fish. They come out. It says they fill now not just the one boat, but the two boats to such a degree that the boats themselves begin to sink. So here's the thing. I don't know if you fishermen in my day. I mean, fishermen have a sense of, you know, their catch. If you get nothing, that's a bad thing, right? Maybe a few nibbles. If you get a couple of fish, and over time, you know what that looks like, okay, fine, that's a decent day. Some days you have a good catch, more than expected. This year, none of those things. Way beyond all of those ideas, all of those expectations, everything they could have possibly thought about. Their nets are breaking, there's so many fish. Their boats are sinking, there are so many fish. And then there's this moment. Peter is seeing this. He's seeing Jesus Christ who is with him in the boat. And he falls on his knees. He confesses his own sinfulness. He recognizes Jesus as the Christ. He calls him Lord, he calls him the Almighty. How does this happen? If it's just the fish and just the broken net and just the sinking boats, all you can say about this is, hey, Jesus knows how to fish. Right? Anytime you want to go out fishing, make sure you call up Jesus because we do this for a living and we like it when we catch fish. So in other words, it's just power. But that's not what's going on. Peter and his friends have been sitting there listening to the Word of God preached to them from the Word of God who is Jesus Christ. They've heard this preaching, they've heard this teaching, they've heard this call, they've heard this identification of the Messiah who has come. And in their minds and in their hearts, putting together now that preaching and teaching, that Word of God along with the sign. The Holy Spirit is at work, and he causes faith, and he puts it into Peter's mouth. This is no ordinary guy. This is no master fisherman. This is the Lord Almighty. And so he falls at Jesus' knees and confesses him as such. Just the sign is never enough, but the Word of God is active, and the Word of God works, and the Holy Spirit uses these things, and he brings people to faith like Peter, people like us. And that's what's happened on this day. And this is the calling of Peter to the ministry. Now, reflecting on this uh, this subject, this uh, this event, and you could, you could see people are going to want to talk about this. This is interesting. People have commented that there's more going on here than just the comparison of Peter as fisherman to Peter becoming the fisher of men. There's more going on here. First and foremost, it's that. That Jesus now, for the first time, but on more than one occasion, will have to calm Peter down on the ocean, on the water. There's a lake, pardon me. And definitely make this comparison before you caught a uh, fish, but now you're going to catch men. So that's the first part. Then you have the fish. You know, when you think about the fish, fish are fairly predictable. What do they not like to eat? like to happen to them. Be caught. They see you, they see the hook, they see the net, off they go. So it is with us. In our sin, in original sin, God comes to us by His Word, God comes to us in any number of ways, and we simply flee Him because of our sin. In that sense, we are just like the fish. You know, you have a place where the fish live. We have a place where we live. Fish live in the water. It's all around them. You ask the fish, hey, what's it like being a fish? What's it like being wet all of the time? Right? See if fish can come. Well, the fish says what? It's being wet. Because the whole of his experience, the whole of his existence is done in that particular circumstance. Does not understand that he's wet. So it is with us. We live in a world so steep, so stained by sin, that we can't even conceive of what life would be like without any sin around us, without sin in our heart. The world in which we live is totally immersed in sin, 
we are immersed in that sin, we don't quite understand it to the fullest degree. And now you have the means for bringing fish out of the sea. Now you have the means given to the fishermen for their work. In Peter's case, it's the net. Throw the net over, pull out the catch. For the apostles and for servants of the word, it is the divinely instituted means and the divinely instituted gifts for calling people out of this world and to faith and to life. It is the gospel. It is the gospel that is read. It is the gospel that is preached. It is holy baptism. It is the Lord's Supper. It is through these means as instruments that we are brought from death to life, that we are brought from sin to the forgiveness of sins. That we are brought out of the suit, which is this world and its sin, and into the boat, which is also interesting. People often will say the reason for the construction of churches in this way, with wood and these sorts of things, is it's supposed to remind us of being inside of a boat, like the ark. And so it is here. What's interesting about this is that when fish are brought out of the water into the boat, they're brought out of life to death. But we are brought by the gospel out of death to life. And in this boat, in this church, in this congregation, in this place, we are kept, we are preserved, we are sustained in the faith, in the boat. That boat that we've been brought into by the fisherman, by the net. And finally, we have the catch itself. Now, the catch for Peter was pure miracle. Nobody can say, oh, Peter finally figured out where the fish were hiding. And just happened to throw them in the net in the right place and just happened to have a catch unheard of in all of fishing history in Gennesaret. This is the work of Christ. This is the work of God. So it is for us. That when God uses the ministers of the word, when God uses the words here, we have preaching, we have baptism, we have the Lord's Supper, the Holy Spirit's at work. This is always a miracle. This is never because of the power of the pastor or the preacher or whoever. It's always the words of God himself, the means that he has established. To bring us again out of death to life. To bring us from sin to the forgiveness of sins. To bring us from the failing existence which we have in this world to the eternal life and salvation that we have with God forevermore. This is always God's work. Let me think. So on this day, we see the calling of Peter himself and his friends. They're called to be the apostles of Christ. This is an instrumental, this is an important part, basic part, of the ministry of Jesus. It was important at that time for the calling of those folks to forgiveness and salvation in life. And it remains important for us because this is how we have come to receive our forgiveness and our life and our salvation. Through work like this from God and through means like this established by God. And so for this we offer our thanks. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.